Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we look at teaching kids about space as we welcome astronomer Dean Regas to the show. He is the author of a new book, 1000 Facts About Space from National Geographic. Now, in years past, students didn't have a whole lot of resources for learning about stars and planets. They would have to rely on books or perhaps a telescope if they were lucky. But all that began to change in the 20th century. In the 1920s and 30s, planetariums began to pop up in schools and museums around the world. These dome-shaped theaters make use of special projectors, simulating the night sky, providing viewers with an up-close and personal look at the stars and planets. Now, this was a game-changer for astronomy education, as it allowed kids and adults a means to experience the night sky in a way that wasn't possible before that time. Planetariums literally opened additional dimensions to astronomy education. Like bringing old photographs to life. The older, more formal expository nature of books, which was often didactic, was replaced by the dynamic nature of a simulated, narrated, denominated universe. Now, planetariums weren't the only new tool that came around to assist in teaching astronomy. In the 1960s and 70s, a space race between the United States and the Soviet Union had kids looking at the stars with renewed interest. NASA's Apollo program and the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope also fueled renewed interest in space science and astronomy education. <laughs> Now, with the advent of the internet, online resources have become readily available, including virtual planetariums, online simulations, and interactive games, allowing children to learn about the cosmos in a fun and engaging way. Now, today, today children's astronomy education is more interactive and accessible than ever before, with the help of planetariums, remote telescopes, and new interactive three-day learning environments, kids can explore the universe in the comfort of their own homes. Check out our own virtual learning space at thecosmiccompanion.space. Next up, we talk with Dean Regas. He is an astronomer at Cincinnati Observatory. His new book, A Thousand Facts About Space, is hot off the presses from National Geographic. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Dean Regas. He is an astronomer at uh, Cincinnati Observatory, and he is former host of Stargazers on PBS. His new book, 1,000 Facts About Space, it recently came out from uh, Nat Geo Kids, and it's wonderful. Welcome to the show, Dean. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So first of all, I always love to start here. What's your origin story? What, what got you into science and writing and education? Well, as, as much as I'm into gung-ho astronomy as I am now, it definitely wasn't uh, destined to be this way. I was uh, grew up wanting to do one thing with my life, and that uh -huh. was to play professional football. Huh. And if know. you were to look at me, uh, I'm about 155 pounds, uh, six feet tall, not exactly built for that, but it was in my brain. And so that's what I thought I would do. I'm going to guess you didn't play linebacker. I got tackled once <laughs> and that was it. And so that was the end. Coach said, 
Sorry, kid, you don't got it. <laughs> so, uh, so I had my fallback, which luckily I always did that early. Uh, so I, I went to school at Xavier University here in Cincinnati, Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, studied uh, history. So I get, graduated oh. to with the idea I'd be a high school history teacher. Took a, a, a time off from that and did part-time jobs working for the Cincinnati Parks doing nature education. Hmm. And then at one of the parks, they had a planetarium. Uh, nobody wanted to run it. And so they said, Dean, you're running the planetarium. Your first show's <laughs> next week. And I was like, uh, I don't know where the North Star is. And they were like, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And so that's when it happened. I was under the dome and they put the stars on the ceiling. And it was like my moment. It, it, the stars were talking to me and I it, it was I knew it. I knew it right away. This was the thing I wanted to do. And I dove in. I learned all I could. And uh, I, I, it's that was uh, 25 years ago, about to the day. I'm, I'm giving my uh, uh, a, a planetarium show at the old planetarium uh, next week. Uh, to celebrate my 25th anniversary of my first show. So it, I would have never thought this is what it would happen, that I'd become an astronomer and 25 years later write a book. Wow. Wow, <laughs> it's so cool. Now, Nat Geo Kids puts out in a whole series of these books, Thousand Facts About, and they're, they're just absolutely incredible. But I'd love to know, like, how you chose particular subjects that you chose. For instance, there's a great section on Mars and another one on astronomers and what how did you go about that how did you choose how to arrange the book well the 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 origin i guess of the thousand facts was from my talks uh my main job at the observatory in cincinnati is education so i give more than 150 talks around the country about astronomy to all ages mm -hmm. and these thousand facts basically are the the greatest hits of all the talks you know these are the thousand facts that kind of resonated with audiences and got their attention. And, and so kind of, I wanted to arrange them in kind of a more logical order. So we group them by subject matter. So there's something about a group about stars or the sun, the moon, planets, that kind of thing. Uh, and I know that people, when they think of astronomy, they also associate that with, with the, the space uh, missions and sending people into space. And so definitely that is something, there's several sections of the book about what it's like to be in space, uh, robotic missions to places, um, and really cool astronomical events that people can see with their eyes too, without even telescopes. Mm, mm. So what's your favorite part? What's your, what part do you really love putting together? Well, I, I, yeah, the, it starts off pretty good, I gotta say. They, they, they talked me into putting the first chapter, the first section was about the biggest and the best and the most extreme things about uh, about space. So we have uh, the uh, fact about the largest black hole, the largest star, uh, the, you know, that kind of thing, the size of the universe. Um, but then, of course, I have a very soft spot for my favorite planet, Saturn. Saturn uh, is just with those gorgeous rings, and you see it it's in a, a telescope. Winner. It looks like a, a a sticker when you look at it through a telescope. It looks totally <laughs> unreal. And and that's what's so cool about this subject is there's so much that is approachable that you can do with your own backyard telescope. So I'm hoping that the these these uh, sections and some of these facts kind of inspire kids. And sneakily, I want to inspire some adults too to uh, to see some of this stuff and and get kind of uh, kind of motivated to go out and see the real sky. Right, right. And speaking of adults and kids, how do you see this book being used? In what ways do you see it being used both by parents and educators, including homeschool educators? I, I think the the initial idea was that this was going to be a book for those uh, spacey students, those those kids that are in the star phase of their lives. You know, they mm -hmm. go through the dinosaur stage, then they go through the star stage and and then they get their driver's license and then that's it. It's all over. So this is for the people that are before that um, and that can't get enough astronomy and know, and in fact, know some of these space facts ahead of time because they're learning it in school. So, but the secondary audience, uh, I think that this is going for is for the adult audience. This is the adults that forgot everything in fourth grade of what they learned about space and that they can come back to it at a real approachable, easy manner. And so my hope is that the two intersect that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, parents pick up the book and say, oh, these are such cool facts. You know who would like this? 
my kid and that they would say, hey, did you know that, uh, you know, this black hole in the center of galaxy M87 is the largest black hole ever seen? And then they can have this conversation and hopefully start uh, this kind of thing where the, the two of them can read it together. That's my hope. Right. That's that's fantastic. And one of the things that I think this book would be fantastic for is I have dedicated my professional life to breaking down barriers to education. I want to get science education in front of everyone. And I think one of the big barriers we have are reluctant readers, kids who don't want to pick up a book because it has a big, long thing in it, uh, you know, a whole lot to read. Whereas this book, you know, you have all these wonderful little facts in it, you know, where they can just digest things by these little pieces. Oh, yeah. You can flip to any page. Uh, one thing doesn't build on the other. So you right. can kind of read as much or as little as you want. Um, and and one of the things that I was, you know, that I do tend to notice with kind of facts book is that their facts books is that, you know, it's just kind of straight up facts. And, you know, this is this big, this is that big. And I wanted to add a little more to this is that uh, it, these were each were really crafted in a way that I, I have a I have a pretty, uh, I, I don't know, I hopefully engaging uh, style in my astronomy teaching. I hope that some of my kind of humor and voice comes through these little bite-sized facts. So I, I hope that they're a little bit more than just like, this is this big, this is that big, that right, it, right. it sparks some imagination too, to, to have, take your mind on a journey to some of these things. Right, right, absolutely. And, uh, and again, you know, humor is another way that we can tear down the barrier to people or kids thinking that science is boring and it's anything but no yeah. absolutely and it's uh you know, there is definitely part of my story to, to become an astronomer and i embrace this fully is my weird hours my <laughs> weird choices of uh vacation spots which always include other observatories dark skies mm -hmm. where i can see uh the real sky up there chasing after eclipses um i it's it's one of those things that uh i i take on a role of um uh, of i'm i'm actually the uh, formal or informal depends on who you talk to but the 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 official astronomer of the city of cincinnati which i take as kind Very of an cool. ancient an ancient rite of passage that you know, I, I am the uh, astronomer royal for it. <laughs> and uh, and so there's this sense of history to it, too. And it's um, it, it is a it, it's an odd kind of journey that I've taken on. And I, I you know, as a kid, I, I had a kind of vision of what scientists were like, and it's not what I've ended up finding to be the actual case. And so I, right. I hope that that the way that uh, I kind of present astronomy is this, uh, you know, th this is this is fun stuff and and uh it's it's interesting me writing a kid's book as an adult when mm -hmm. i have the same almost joy and genuine wonder of the universe as an 11 year old reading this like we are basically the same mental age <laughs> right right and when it comes because i am so fascinated by the stuff it's a genuine thing, and I, uh, I, I, I hope, yeah, it comes through uh, through the books. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you were talking about you know developmental stages earlier, and uh, you know I'm not sure that I ever actually got over my dinosaur stage. Oh, you're still in the dinosaur stage, All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been working, you know, astronomy and space exploration, you know, most of my life, adult life, and I still love me some dinosaurs. Well, once we uh, maybe there's an exoplanet out there where we're going to find some dinosaurs, then the two will merge together. And boy, who could stop a dinosaur planet? That would be cool. It really would. It really would. All right. So um, I'm wondering, like, how, you know, you now there, there's, of course, the whole idea of the overview effect. People go into space and they realize, you know, we're all one little blue marble and you know, one species. And I love how science in general can have that effect on people. And, you know, just really get them to realize that, you know, we are all 
one species on one fragile planet with paper thin atmosphere. And um, I'm wondering how you see space, space exploration and education affecting the next generation of kids. Well, you're absolutely right about, you know, the, the, all the astronauts that I've talked to that have been up in space uh, or, you know, they come back changed. Uh, yeah. They, you know, and, you know, these are, these are some exceptional humans that are chosen to be astronauts and go through this kind of thing and to see how they're moved by the experience. And you just got to think, boy, if only everybody on earth could do that, you know, and kind of get this, this perspective on things. And unfortunately, that's you know the space travel for the average person is not going to be around. I don't think for in my lifetime, I doubt. But um, what astronomy does for me is yeah, it takes me on these journeys through my mind and my imagination. And and so when people ask you, oh, so what are the benefits of space travel? What's the benefits of building gigantic telescopes and studying things far away? It's because we're adventurers. We are. This is what is in our DNA, uh, our ancestors, no matter where you are on the globe, were astronomers in the past. This was this is built into what we're doing. We're always looking up and seeing the stuff. So it excites our imagination, not to mention our growth in technology. The, 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 the technology that we're using right now to communicate across the country uh, instantly is a direct result of our adventures in space it's uh we wouldn't be doing this uh this well at this point in our uh evolution if we didn't have the space program so it's uh it's one of those things that you know we i'm not thinking that i'm ever gonna be chosen to go to the moon or mars but hitching a ride on these uh mentally hitching a ride on these robotic spacecrafts and flying around the rings yeah, of saturn right, right. It takes me there. That's that's it. It still does. Right, right. And finally, what's next for you? What's 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 next on the on in your plans? Well, there is uh, there has been some part of the book, uh, the Thousand Facts About Space book that does that does resound with some people, and that is the Pluto section. Ah. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, the people are talking about, well, you know, Pluto was a planet, and when I was a kid. So it just so happens, I have another book out that's called How to Teach Grownups About Pluto. Yeah, uh, I love that a, idea. It's a, it's a kids' <laughs> book to. Uh, uh, to help uh, r r kind of uh, your your grownups that are in crisis to uh, uh, to cope with the loss of a planet. Uh, we had nine planets know, when I was a kid. When I you know, I just years. happen to have it right here. So <laughs> All right. Wait, wait, I can't block the Nat Geo book, but I have to put this book up there All too. All right, so, cool. So wherever you get your books, look for How to Teach Gross about Pluto. Uh, it, yeah, uh, that one's, I'll, I'll just put it up here. How about that? That sounds good. Excellent, great. excellent. Uh, <laughs> So that's that's one I'm really excited about. Um, this year is some big stuff. We've got two solar eclipses coming. Two solar eclipses coming up in short right. order, right. and I, a lot of people are talking about the big total eclipse April of next year. But I want people to don't sleep on this one in October. We have an October 14th almost total solar eclipse. And so that's my uh, that's my goal for the year is to get everybody prepared for both eclipses, mm -hmm. so everybody across the country can see this because seeing eclipses are just out of this world. They and, are. Uh, it's, it's I mean, amazing. you probably saw the 2017 yep. one yep. and I, what it I went did. out to see totality. It was a cultural phenomenon, yep. uh, and and this one 2024 is going to do the same. And uh, but the, there's a lot of. Uh, with the last one, there was a lot of last minute stuff and last minute people right. getting glasses and, and, and all that stuff. So we want everybody to be ready by October so they can see both eclipses and uh, do it safely and, and get wowed by it. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Dean. It was fabulous talking with you. Great talking with you. Thanks so much. Great. And that was Dean Regas, astronomer at Cincinnati Observatory. Check out his new book, 1000 Facts About Space from Nat Geo Kids.
And in the future, children of all ages will have access to even more advanced technology for learning about stars, planets, and all those other fun little things up in the sky there. Uh, virtual reality headsets have the ability to transport them to distant galaxies, while augmented reality apps allow children from light polluted cities to see constellations in the night sky in real time. Generative AI, similar to JetGBT and Dolly, will soon be providing guided tours of the universe. These new technologies will make learning about astronomy more immersive, interactive, and popular than ever. As we continue to explore and discover more about the universe, astronomy education for children will become more diverse, inclusive, and culturally sensitive, incorporating perspectives from cultures and communities around the globe. With increasing recognition of climate change, it's too bloody hot. Educating students about the impact of human activities on the planet becomes crucial. In addition, understanding the role of space exploration and astronomy in recognizing and mitigating environmental changes to the Earth grows even more vital. In the future, children will have the opportunity to explore the universe in ways that we can't even imagine today. Whether you're a student in a classroom, an educator, or a curious kid at home, the sky is the limit when it comes to learning about the stars and planets. Actually, you know what? This is astronomy, so the sky is just the beginning. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we look at traveling to the moon from Apollo to Artemis, talking with Andy Saunders. His new book, Apollo Remastered, is filled with newly enhanced images, giving readers an unprecedented look at the legendary Apollo program. There's a clip from that interview. And I was just, I couldn't believe what, what I was looking at, you know, and I knew what this meant. It was, you know, a, a really clear image of Neil Armstrong on the moon. You can see his face, you can see his eyelid. Yeah. So I don't think anything will ever kind of top that. Uh, but the front cover's got a bit of everything. It was a very underexposed photograph. We almost never see it. It's become this incredible atmospheric portrait. It's the only photograph of an Apollo astronaut in the full suit and bubble helmet in the lunar module. It's a historic moment because he's actually looking up through the docking window, undertaking the first ever docking in space between two crewed spacecraft. I spoke to Rusty Schweikart, who took that photograph, um, and he said, I can't tell you how hard he's concentrating in that moment. You know, this is the first time they'd ever undertaken the docking. Right. The controls right. were set up to look forwards out of the windows for landing on the moon, but because right. they were testing it in Earth orbit, he was looking up the, through the docking window, so he had to translate through 90 degrees all of those movements they were in a spacecraft that couldn't get them home there was no heat shield because it was the lunar module that they were testing so if they didn't right. dock to the command module that had the heat shield they were in trouble they're in, big, they're in trouble so yeah. it's high pressure historic moment concentrating hard and yet it also happens to be this cinematic atmospheric portrait so that has a bit of everything in it and hence wow. you know being on the front cover and if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, follow, share, and tell your friends all about the Cosmic Companion. Even I subscribe. If you're in a sky riding, feel free to place that across the sky. I know, as long as you use environmentally friendly chemicals, of course. If T be true, thou art going to writeth words in the sky, at least useth chemicals which art safe for the earth. I want to make sure I get every episode of The Cosmic Companion in my email inbox every Saturday. Is that what you said? You want to make sure you get every episode of The Cosmic Companion in your email inbox every Saturday? Wow! I got good news for you. Take a trip on over to thecosmiccompanion.net and sign up for our newsletter and all your dreams will come true. Now, at least the ones having to do with seeing every episode of The Cosmic Companion, Clear Skies.